Imagine you're a cardiologist and you realize you're having a heart attack. Or imagine you're a neuroscientist, a specialist on how the brain works, realizing that you, yourself, are having a major stroke. Everything you studied is happening to you. That's exactly what happened to today's guest, neuroanatomist and stroke survivor, Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. Uh, by anyone's definition, mm. I was in a vegetative condition um, in an infant in a woman's body. Welcome to the Brain Injury Awareness Project podcast presented by Brain Injury Services, a nonprofit leader in developing services for children, adults, and veterans who have experienced a brain injury. I'm Erin Mattingly, a speech-language pathologist and board chair of Brain Injury Services. And whether you're a brain injury survivor, a family member or friend or caregiver, a clinician or a researcher, we're pleased to have you join us for these important conversations. You may even be a person who just wants to know more about brain injuries since they impact millions of Americans every year. One new brain injury occurs every nine seconds. Our focus for today's episode is a single word that can be so terrifying. Stroke. Our guest today is Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, a Harvard trained and published neuroanatomist who, as irony would have it, in 1996 at the age of 37, experienced a severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of her brain. It took eight years for her to rebuild her brain, and her journey provided her with a unique perspective in her studies of the brain. She memorialized that journey in her New York Times best selling book, My Stroke of Insight. She has been and continues to be a powerful voice for brain injury. Dr. Jill was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. She's been interviewed by Oprah, and her TED Talk has been watched over 28 million times. She also recently released a new book, Whole Brain Living, The Anatomy of Choice and the Four Characters that Drive Our Life. Together, Dr. Jill and I are going to take a deep dive into the health and well-being of brain cells, and we'll recap some of the insights she's gathered in the 25 years since My Stroke of Insight debuted. I'm excited and honored to talk with you today, Dr. Jill. I'm actually fangirling a little bit because as a speech-language pathologist, we all know who you are. Um, So thank you, thank you for your time today. And I'm looking forward to learning all of the things from you and having a great conversation. I think a lot of survivors here, there's no cure for brain injury. And so kind of what your research is showing around, you know, how that can impact recovery and how it worked with you. And maybe we can start by sharing with our audience a little bit about your stroke, if you can talk about that day and and maybe a a brief um, story about your recovery. Yeah. So I had, I was 37 years old. I was at Harvard Medical School. My job was teaching and performing research. Neuro was my specialty. So I studied the brain and I also taught gross anatomy, which is cadaver lab. So I'm a real anatomy junkie and I love cells. To me, neurons, the primary cell of the brain, they're just these most amazingly beautiful creatures and they work together in order for us to have any ability at all. Every ability we have is because we have cells that perform that function. So then when I was 37 years old, I experienced a major hemorrhage in the left half of my brain. And it was a congenital uh, arteriovenous malformation, which I'd been born with, but I didn't know was there, but I was at the perfect age for this thing to blow. And uh, so over the course of four hours, I watched my own brain deteriorate through the eyes of a scientist. So I was actually watching certain circuits go offline because now my brain wasn't capable of performing those functions. Um, and, And as a neuroanatomist, I think in terms of the cells and the circuits, so I was actually aware that I were more or less where the problem was And, um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, I was so distracted by the wonder and the examination of my brain that maybe that interfered a little in my actually executing action in order to call 911. So first thing I just want to say is stroke, brain trauma, 
emergency, call 911 before it escalates to the next level of non-function. And even if you hear language inside of your own head, so you think, oh, well, I'm not so bad, try speaking because you might be surprised. I did not know that I could not speak until I tried because internal dialogue was still functioning. Um, so, um, so it took uh, four hours on the morning of the stroke um, for me to get help. And by that afternoon, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. Uh, by anyone's definition, I was in a vegetative condition um, and an infant in a woman's body. Wow. Wow. What a powerful statement there, too. An infant in a woman's body. Wow. You said you didn't have any warning signs, right? Because the AVM was was a genetic you know, issue. So other than kind of feeling over those four hours what was happening, was there anything else? Yes, actually, when, when well, so I was born in 1959, so I know everybody's doing math right now. And um, uh, so I'm 62 now, and the, the stroke happened at, at 37. Uh, when I was 17 years old, um, I was diagnosed by my family physician as having migraine headaches. Um, I had this just horrible headache. It was pounding behind one eye. I felt nausea. I couldn't really speak. I was light sensitive. I mean, I had every symptom of my severe migraine headache. And so I was diagnosed with migraine headache. And then I would have one of these headaches maybe once, maybe twice a year, or maybe not at all in a year. And so it was hard to figure it out because it wasn't happening all the time. Was it cheap chocolate at Easter? Was it, you know, we just didn't know what it was. Um, and then it turned out that I, I didn't respond to any of the up and coming medications. And in those days, though, I have to say they didn't have a lot of medications for really helping with migraine. And the only thing I could do is get a shot of Demerol in my bum and then go to sleep for 24 to 48 hours to give it time to dissipate. Well, it turned out that after I had my hemorrhage my and then surgery, my neurologist said, Jill, we know you have a history of, of migraine headache. We don't think you're having migraines. We think you were having small bleeds from this AVM because I was, I was before MRIs and CAT scans, I was just, it was never diagnosed. And so once I had the AVM removed uh, two and a half weeks after the hemorrhage happened, I have not had a, a migraine headache. <laughs> I've had a few other weird things. I have had a post-traumatic stress flashback to the morning of the stroke twice, but I've never had another migraine headache. So I always tell people, if you experience migraine headaches and you do not respond to the current medicines, go and have your brain looked at. Go and make sure you're not having small bleeds with uh, an AVM. Wow, that's incredible. Jeez. That's scary too. <laughs> it is. It's scary. Yeah. I mean, what would the, what would I have done if if I'd have had an MRI and they came back and they said, um, Jill, you have this this ugly thing inside of your head and it could blow and kill you, or you know, completely wipe you out as uh, in a vegetative condition and that you may never recover, or you go and get it cut out and I'm going brain surgery. <laughs> what? Who volunteered for that? I don't. Know. I don't know. It's like, seriously, you know, that's it. That would be a tough call, but we have, to make those, we have to make those calls uh, based on, uh, you know, our, our own, our own, we all have to, uh, you know, we face our own stuff medically. And you mentioned losing function. And, and you know, when I treat patients, I always try to make my treatments very functional. Just curious in your perspective, what, you know, a functional treatment maybe that you experienced or, um, what you view as as functional recovery, um, just from your your experience. So, um, first of all, I look at everything as cells. You know, I'm a brain anatomist, so I am all about the cells in the brain. And if someone's had any kind of brain trauma and they're they're paralyzed, for example, well, the problem's not in the body, probably unless that got a second hit. The problem is with the cells in the brain. 
And mm-hmm. I, so I always go back to the cells in the brain. And if it's a motor, you know, I, I believe people function better with an education. So if I have a certain paralysis, let's say um, I've got a brain injury and my, my, uh, my right side is impacted. Um, okay, well, what parts of my right side still function? Okay. Um, and usually there's something there, right? Um, where's the sensation? And actually helping people visualize through pictures, these are the groups of cells that are responsible for that action. And then it's like, oh, I'm really realizing my problem is in the brain and it is those cells. And then it's kind of like, what is working outside of it? And how do I keep going closer and closer and closer to the depth of the problem by increasing? Because that's how cells are going to recover. If you've got a wound inside of the brain, whatever the cells are in the center, they're going to be the last to recover. So what is potentially already kind of functioning, let's strengthen those cells and then move. And so, so if it's like, like a limb and the whole arm is paralyzed, can I get, you know, can I move my ribs on that side? Can I use, move my shoulder girdle at all in order to then get those muscles of the shoulder? Cause they're so complex. Well, what can I do? What can I not do working that area? If, if my, my PT is saying, here, grab this thing. And it's like, well, I can't even barely get the shoulder to move. Why are you making me use the other pieces? Let me work up to it. So I believe in taking taking the problem at the level of the cells in the brain and going out to what is potentially functional. What can I do? And then what comes next? And then what comes next? And then what comes next? Instead of just diving in for uh, it's all or nothing, because if it's all or nothing, I'm going to end up with something sloppy if I get anything at all. What we know about the brain and what we know about uh, therapy Therapy has been around for a whole lot longer than we've known about the brain. And unfortunately, the therapeutic strategies have not adapted well to what we actually understand about cellular rehabilitation, because those therapies were designed when we didn't even believe in neuroplasticity, you know, the ability of the brain to recover. So, uh, so we're really in a new game and trying to figure out how do we play this game the best for people in this day and age who are experiencing trauma. Yeah, no, that's such a good point. And I mean, even, even back when I was in grad school, we were still learning that neurons, you know, don't regenerate. There was some discussion about neuroplasticity, but it was, you know, once the cells are, are dead, they're, they're dead, they're gone. Um, so it, kind of speaking along those lines, you mentioned that you had to train your right brain to take over for some of the left brain functions. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I acknowledge that the left brain cells were wounded and the right brain cells were present and I could use, because the right brain is, uh, has the ability to, to paint in pictures. So even as an academic, when I teach, I teach to the left brain, which is the language, here's the outline, here's what we're gonna talk about, here's the details, fill in all the words. That's what the left brain does. But the right brain thinks in pictures and in circuits. And so I lost the words, but I still had this visual understanding of how the brain organizes itself. I just lost the language in order to be able to talk about it um, or think about it in those terms. So for me, I really focused on, I am a bilateral entity. And so everything that I do, I need to focus on the bilaterality of that. And so when it came to like a movement skill, like in order to move, once I could ambulate once I had enough strength in my right leg, because my left side, my right side went paralyzed because it was a left brain trauma. Once I could get up and ambulate, 
Then it was a matter of, okay, how do I, how do I use the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere to create a gentle rhythmic pattern between them? And if I could establish a walking pattern that was not just step with the left leg, drag, heave, kind of hold the right leg around, it's like, okay, how do I, how do I try to synchronize these different body parts so that I can draw because we have fibers going between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere at the level of the brain. So if I have trauma in my left hemisphere, not only do I have the trauma of what those cells do, which may be to move that right leg rhythmically, but I am connected to the exact same uh, 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 group of cells on the opposite hemisphere. So if I can do one thing and the other and create a rhythmic connection between the two, then I'm not just using the power of the left to the right prob problematic part of the system, but I'm using the power of the healthy part of the system and working myself bilaterally. And boy, did that make a difference in my recovery. That's incredible. I have never thought about recovery that way before. Um, wow. And the other thing is that even at every level of the spinal cord, literally half the fibers that come in as motor or go out as sensory are crossing at that level of the spinal cord. So why not do everything is bilateral and it's bilateral all the way up. So how can we use the system of what we know to be true anatomically to work what's working to fuel power and security and strengthen that which is, has been weakened or dismissed as functional? We always talk about people being a left brain person or a right brain person, and you you spoke a little bit about you know left brain is more logical, um, maybe organized type A like this one, um, right brain is you know artsy and maybe into more into music and visual. Um, but in your book, um, the whole whole brain living, you talk about it's not really a thing. Can you expand on that a little bit more? That the right brain and the left brain, you, you know, we talked a little bit about the bilateral bilateral piece of it, but love to get more on that. Yeah. So um, first of all, th there are two very significant differences between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And this is based completely on personal experience through the eyes of a scientist. And, um, you know, back in the 70s, they cut the corpus callosum, but which is 300 million axonal fibers running between the two hemispheres so that uh, you know, we have that corpus callosum so that we have essentially one big brain. Everybody's talking to everybody. Everything's, you know, together. Um, but back in the 70s, they cut that. And then they ended up with these characters who had essentially two very different ways of being. And um, and so uh, so so and I was actually in in school in my doctoral program during that period of time. So it was fascinating to me. It's like, oh, my God, these two hemispheres really are different. And so having had the experience of not cutting the two, but wiping out the left hemisphere, I was still com completely conscious, but I didn't have any of the skill sets of any of the cells that live in that left hemisphere because they were swimming in a pool of blood and they were traumatized. So, um, so I got to exist in an absolutely 100% quiet, silent mind for five weeks, two and a half weeks after the stroke, and then two and a half weeks after surgery uh, that happened in there. And so, but I wasn't unconscious. I was completely consciously aware of what those cells were able to do. And then I could use those cells to say, okay, I knew how to have language. So now I can, and this goes back to you, you saying, how did I use the right brain to recognize what was now missing in the left brain in order for me to become functional again as a whole brain person. So um, uh, in the right here, right now experience, uh, that's what the right hemisphere is. First of all, it's right here, right now. I had no past. I had no future. I had no exp no understanding of the external world. I had no language. I didn't know what a mother was, much less who my mother was. All I had was the present moment experience. And there was no me, the individual, no Jill Bolte-Taylor in the present moment. Mm 
So I know who I am because there's a group of cells in my left brain in language that tells me repeatedly throughout the day, oh, who am I? I'm Joe Bolte Taylor. Here's my phone number. Here's my this. Here's my that. And we all know we can we can scatter on other people's names, but we can also even scatter on who am I? You know, where am I? You wake up in, the, in you know, if you travel a lot, you wake up and you're going, where am I? You know, well, oh, yeah. Oh, because the left brain's going, I haven't been here long long enough to actually really remember which hotel room I'm in. Cause every night I'm in a, I sleep around the world, you know, like, where am I anyway? So, um, uh, so, so what, what, but what happens is that each of those cells, each of those groups of cells run in a circuit and then they have, they function and then they have an ability. And then I have that ability. So you as a speech pathologist, you're looking at different people who have had trauma to different groups of cells. Can they comprehend when someone else speaks? Can they create the sounds of other words, dog, dog? And then do they have the cells that apply a meaning to that sound so that then they can be functional again and actually not just understand, but create sound in order to be able to communicate with another person. But it's all based on the cells, the ability of the those cells to recover, the ability of those cells to communicate with one another, and then those ability to be able to have functionality. Okay. Wow. And you talked to you about, um, this is kind of leading into the, the characters. I love, I love these, the, the four characters. Um, so tell, tell us about that. So when we think about the human brain, we have two emotional. So first of all, think about the mammal. What's a mammal? Think what's the difference between a mammal and a reptile? A reptile essentially has the sophisticated level of our brain stem. OK, and um, and in the thalamus and these are pretty much on off switches. This is I'm hungry. I eat. I'm done. I'm thirsty. I drink. My brain tells me I'm done. Um, I'm ready for sex. I have sex. I'm done. So it's really on off switches and they're pretty simple. Simple living. Then the system adds new tissue on top of it. So the difference between a reptile and a mammal is the addition of new tissue, and that's the limbic or emotional tissue. And this is the tissue of our fight or flight, our sympathetic nervous system. So we've heard about the amygdala, the hippocampi, and maybe even the, the cingulate gyri. So those are the primary groups of cells of the limbic system that's, that define the difference between a mammal and a reptile. And then human comes along and we get thinking tissue, cognitive tissue on both hemispheres, the neo or new cortex. So the human has the brainstem, the limbic emotional in both hemispheres, as well as the thinking tissue in both hemispheres. Well, if there's a fundamental difference between the right hemisphere, which is right here, right now, and I, me, the individual don't exist, then my in the level of the emotional tissue, the right hemisphere is going to be the experience of the present moment, while the left hemisphere emotion is going to be me, the individual, I have linearity of time, I have a past, a present, and a future, and all my pain and emotion and trauma from the past is going to be located in that tissue. And then in the thinking tissue, in the right hemisphere, it's just right here, right now, I'm big as the universe connected to all that is, but the thinking tissue in the left hemisphere is the boundaries of where do I I, me, Joe Bolte Taylor, begin and end. So if I experience a trauma to my right hemisphere, I am going to have completely different symptoms and problems than if I experience a trauma in my left hemisphere, because those cells are performing different functions as it relates to me, the individual, and my ability to communicate with the external world. So we essentially end up with these four modules of cells, the left thinking tissue, the left emotional tissue, the right emotional tissue, and the right thinking tissue. And each of those groups of cells are, 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 have their own create, do their own thing. They create an ability or functions. And actually they feel like a whole character, a whole personality inside of my body. So the name of the new book is Whole Brain Living, because the ultimate goal is to balance out everything, have access to all my brain, whole brain living, the anatomy of choice. 
and the four characters that drive our life. So that's what I'm talking about with the four characters are these these right, uh, left and right, th emotional and right and left thinking modules of cells. And since you're looking at organizations, people who have different kinds of trauma, depending on where that trauma is, it's probably going to influence at least one or two of those four characters. For me, my characters one, my left, my left thinking tissue, it was wiped okay. out and my left emotion that was right wiped out. So Jill Bolte Taylor essentially died that day and all of her book learning and all of her language and all of her linearity of time and all of her relationships and all of that was gone. But in the absence of that, what did I gain? I gained an uninhibited experience of the magnificence of the present moment. And that was fine. So then I end up, you know, big as the universe going, wow, you know, what do I do with this? And then once the surgery happened, then it's like, okay, there's cells over there, uh, circuits I need to rebuild. How do I do that? And that was the process of, of the evolution of my recovery. Cell by cell, circuit by circuit. I love that. And, and, and then how did you... How did you gain the awareness that you were regaining, you know, your your two characters on the left side, the the thinking and the emotional piece? How, how when did that all start clicking in? They didn't click in until my character one, which is my rational thinking organized in the external world, puts the stapler back where the stapler belongs, personality. It came online. I had all those skills. I had the language. I had, I had, I had the definition of where I begin and where I end. So I had the sensory organized. I had the motor organized. I had me now reorganized. I had the cognitive possibilities come back online and it's saying I'm back and I'm ready to take over the brain again and the rest of the characters over here in the right hemisphere are going you're a valuable member of the team but no no we're not living our life based on your value structure which is all about me 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 the individual when my right hemisphere characters are going I'm big as the universe. We are humanity. We are one human family in relationship to this magnificent planet that we have to have a symbiotic relationship with so that we all can thrive or we're all going to die. Right. Right. <laughs> that is uh, very true. That is very true. When I give her a character one. I call her Helen and it's like, you know, your thinking has gotten this planet into this skewed perception of, of, of how we are going to be as humanity. And, and, you know, right now we're in a mental health, mental illness crisis of the whole planet. I mean, it's great to have those skills, but that character cannot be the one who's making the big picture decisions or somebody's going to push a button because there's a button to push. Okay. So. Tell us about the brain huddle. What is it? How does it, does it involve the four characters? What is, what is that all about? Excellent. So, you know, um, inside of one head, I mean, that was a great example of how, you know, once character one came back online and it wanted to take over again and run my life, the other characters are looking at it going, seriously, we are so glad we can do these things again. I mean, life without language is tough, right? Ling uh, life without order uh, is tough. Living in chaos and existing in a world where I can't make sense out of anything is tough. So we are so glad you're back online, but you need to learn how to live in relationship to the rest of us. And so um, there's this tool I use called the brain huddle and brain is an acronym for B-R-A-I-N. And B is for breath. Breath, why breath? Breath, it happens in the present moment. It doesn't happen in the past. It doesn't happen in the future. Breath is a right here, right now phenomenon. In the present moment, I can say, okay, brain huddle, I can increase the amplitude of my breathing, I can increase the frequency of my breathing, but breath, focus on breath. R stands for recognize which of the four characters called the huddle. Well, my character one, which is structured and organized, she may even have a, a, you know, a watch that dings every hour on the hour. And it's like, okay, character one's calling a huddle. 
call an auto. Character two may call a huddle if my heart is broken or I feel sad or I feel mad or I feel whatever it is I'm feeling might call a huddle. I need some help. I need some support. I need some self-soothing. I need, I need, I need, I need something. Character three, just out of the blue, might say huddle because the character three likes to cuddle. Character three is like so happy and in the present. Let's have a huddle. Let's feel that feeling of all of us. And character four is good. Character four is always there, always loving, always supportive, always good uh, to bring its love into the huddle. So B is breath. Bring your mind to the present moment. R is recognize which of those four characters actually called the huddle. A is appreciate regardless of which character called the huddle, there's four of us. There's always four of us. I always have all four of my characters. You always have all four of your characters. I'm interacting my four with your four. So there's eight in every relationship of two people. I mean, all of a sudden, didn't we get complex? So, um, yeah. A, appreciate I've got four and you've got four. And so if all of a sudden you're being really crabby and really mean to me and you're unhappy, it's like, oh, she's in her little character too. So I can come in as my character four and I can be loving with you or I can like come in as my character too and throw it right back at you, right? And that's right, 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 right. And two character twos will never find a resolution. So when we're in a tip for tap fighting space and you have to, you have to understand if I'm experiencing a brain trauma, I get exhausted very quickly and you know, nothing like, like being hungry, being angry, being lonely, being tired, you know, the halt of the 12 step programming, they can throw me into my character to unhappiness because I'm exhausted. And by definition, I need more sleep if I've got a trauma in my brain because they're trying to figure out what the heck are they doing and how do they do it better, right? And if there's all this noise or all this light, which is also noise or, or distraction or people or people are unhappy and yelling at me. I mean, it's just like, how do I, how do I shut that out and allow myself to find some peace? So A is appreciate. We always have four of us. I, B-R-A-I, inquire within. In this next moment, which character do I want to be? Well, in this moment, I could say, I'm going to be character three. I'm going to run out and be experiential and dive into the water and go do that. Well, it's not appropriate, right? So we're negotiating. There's this ongoing conscious negotiation now instead of my head, instead of an unconscious disruption of communication. It's like, how do I actually get the different parts of my brain to talk to one another? So be breath or recognize who called the huddle. A, appreciate regardless of who called the huddle, there's four of us. I inquire which of us is we go, uh, am I going to bring out next? And then N stands for navigate. Navigate your life moment by moment by moment. And realize that you always have the power at any instant to call a brain huddle. And the more you practice that, it becomes an exercise inside of your brain anytime you run circuits over and over again, they get stronger, they begin to run on automatic. That's how we create habitual thinking. And we can change our habits, our cognitive and emotional habits, because it's just cells in circuitry. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. And it, it, it just, just the metacognitive piece of all of that is, is pretty fascinating. You know, just that, yeah, you can have them all speak to each other. And yeah. Yeah. And so just think about it as when you're in, when let's say you go to work, you're a speech therapist. And so let's say you go in and you can immediately tell, is my, is my person who I'm working with, are they in their character one? Do they want to work and learn? Are they in their character two? Are they sad and unhappy and feeling bad for themselves? Are they in their character three where they're just fidgety and distracted and um, not really attached to anything I have to say? Or are they in their four where they're just kind of completely zoned out on another planet, right? In a peaceful space, but I don't have their attention. The learning switch is not turned on. So you walk in and there's four of you walking in. Well, if they're in their little character two, then you probably step, you either come in as your one and kind of demand them to get out of their character two. Well, how well is that going to work? Not as well as if they're already in their character one, right? Because I'm unhappy. I'm sad. I don't want you to fix me. I want you to love me. 
right? So I need you to then come in and I need you to take my hand and, and support me and say, hi, Jill, how are you? It's good to see you again. And it's like, how you feeling? How you doing? How's Jill? And connect with me. And then it's like, oh, I'm feeling loved. Oh, I can, I can, I can be here. I can connect. And then it's like, well, what? What do you think? Do you think maybe we could like do a little bit of this? Do you think this might be fun? How can we make it fun so that you can learn? And then it's like, okay, I feel better now. Yeah. So you'll either appeal to my three or you'll you'll appeal to my one. And and this is what relationships with other human beings is really about. <laughs> It's like, yeah. it's like recognizing who am I in any moment? Who are you in any moment? And what is our interaction? And is that an interaction? How do we make it a better interaction? Yes, yes. And I love that for not only clinicians, but also for um, caregivers, right? And, and survivors themselves, if they're, if they're in a, a peer support situation, um, but also just like you said, every human relationship, right? Coming into it, trying to know what yeah what what character people are tapped into at the moment wow right and sleep is everything and that's why you know i always say is there any way when i'm working with with somebody who's in the hospital and you're on the hospital schedule and let's say you come and you i have an appointment with you at three o'clock but i am absolutely exhausted because of who knows what well how much am i going to get out of my time with you because i'm completely burned out and i always i'm such an advocate for sleep and and that's why why, why, you know, a, a sleep cycle is 90 to 110 minutes, but that's the most important time of my day if I'm experiencing a brain trauma. Don't interrupt that sleep unless you absolutely have to, and then expect me to be alert or aware because, you know, when we wake up and it breaks a cycle, it actually is physical pain. And so if I'm in physical pain, now I'm irritated with you. I'm in my character too. I'm not very happy. I'm not going to learn anything anyway. So, you know, it would have been probably a better idea to not have me have therapy that day. Or if there's any way you can like get therapy to someone else nearby and then come back later when I'm awake, what a difference that makes. It's just cells and circuitry. How can professionals work with us and how can we set ourselves up for success? If I know you're coming at three, then turn off the TV, turn off the noise, turn off the visitation, put earplugs in my ears, let, support me going to sleep and resting so that by the time I get to you, I am ready. How do we truly prep me for that? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a tough one. Cause I remember, you know, when I was working inpatient or ICU, you're there on your schedule and then you have to wake them up and get the therapy in. But I, I, I like this perspective because you're right. Sleep is so important to healing, especially in those early stages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, something for all of us, I think providers to think about, are there things that we can do to help with cell recovery? Um, you know, is it nutrition is, you know, movement uh, what are what are some things that we can do to to promote that all of that but you know to me sleep is number 1 sleep is you know cells are living creatures so they eat they create poop right? Bottom line, they're creating waste. And that waste, where's it go? It goes in the space between the cells. And we're trying to communicate in that space. So it's just like a city. If you have a city and the garbage cleaners don't come in and clean out the town, this town becomes paralyzed and it can't function. Sleep is when um, uh, the input has stopped, uh, relatively speaking, and it's time for the garbage people, the waste cleaners, those cells to come in and eat up the waste and take it away. Uh, so that's critical. Number one in my book is protect sleep. Uh, number two, what are you feeding? You know, what am I eating? If I'm eating a lot of sugar, um, sugar is, uh, it's shaped like a razor blade. And so it goes through the blood vessels, just slicing up all those little, because what's a blood vessel? It's a bunch of little cells all packed together, making a tube. So if I'm a, a sugar molecule and I'm swooping through, I'm slicing those cells, they're spilling their guts out into the space, the immune system has what we call inflammation. Well, what's inflammation? It's the natural response 
to trauma, cellular trauma. So we end up with all this inflammation. So now the, everybody's really busy inside of this body instead of all the attention being able to really be given to the brain cells and the trauma that is already there. So now if we have trauma everywhere in the body, it's distracted away from where we really want that focus to be, which is now on those beautiful brain cells. So cut back on the sugar. Uh, caffeine, what does caffeine? do well it pumps everybody up so everybody's functioning like really quickly well i don't want everybody functioning really quickly i want things to slow down because if i'm a cell and i'm going to learn i don't learn quickly i learn instead caffeine's going to make me impatient i can't do it you're asking me to do it i can't do it i'm failing i'm unhappy about my feeling i'm a loser uh i don't want to try anymore you're frustrated so so all of these things make a difference at the cellular level. And that's why I always keep going back to the cells. So what am I consuming? What is my sleep level? Movement is so important because 20%, 25% of the blood in the body has got to get up to the brain, to those beautiful cells. Well, if I'm laying around in a bed all the time, yeah, I'm pumping my blood, but how much blood am I pumping? Right. And my body, the beauty of the body is that that all it's like like at a, at a motor level, all cells are interconnected. Right. Everything seems to be connected to the movement system. So any movement, any movement at all. Um, and this is why I think it's so important if I am completely paralyzed that I do get movement. But don't give me movement because you think you're rehabilitating me. Give me movement because you're helping move my blood so that I can be rehabilitated. I like that. Okay. Okay. All, all things I think we've all heard in terms of the sleep and the movement and nutrition, but I like this perspective of, you know, it's cell recovery, it's cell wellness, it's um, prevention um, and, and the blood movement moving through the body. I think that's such a good perspective and a different one. Um, okay. Well, I hate that we have to, uh, end our conversation because this has been definitely the highlight of my week, if not month. Um, so maybe we can just do a quick recap here of some of the things that we touched on for the audience. So we talked through your stroke experience and your experience as a survivor, um, some really interesting perspectives about healing and recovery and, and, and function and how the four characters all tie into those things. And that as, you know, as caregivers and providers and, and survivors, you know, thinking about how you're coming into a situation in a relationship based on those four characters. Um, and then also, you know, the, the cell wellness and prevention and, and how we can work to protect ourselves because as you said, you can't do anything without them. So we really need to, to protect them today. I want to go out with this understanding. We are in a hurry. Neurons are not in a hurry. Neurons are not in a hurry. And so if we are impatient with our recovery, first, stay consistent in understanding and pursuing the recovery. But these are cells in trauma and cells in trauma require time for the inflammation to go down so that the cells in the space can stay clear. Uh, we're going to be working with what we can do to help what, what we can do next, what we can do next, what we can do next. Um, it's like, it's, it's, it's like development all over again. You're not going to have a baby and expect it to walk, right? You're going to have a baby and it's going to have to figure out that it's got a body and it wants to move it. And then it's going to like rock it and then it's going to roll it and then it's going to sit up and then it's going to hold itself up and then it's going to flip itself over. And then it's going to, you know, this progression and Recovery is the same way. We start little, we go to the next piece, to the next piece, to the next piece, to the next piece. And eventually it's like, wow, I recovered piece by piece by piece. But we're in a hurry and neurons are not. So don't judge the recovery negatively. At the same time, I'm a firm believer if I've got a trauma, my whole world has to be about recovering. If I'm distracting myself with TV, that's noise. If I'm distracting myself with all these other things, 
That's noise. What is noise and how do I protect myself? And the worst thing in the world I thought anybody could ever do for me was stick a TV in front of my head and call that stimulation because that's not stimulation. That is noise and it makes me zone away. It's exhausting. Well, thank you, Dr. Jill. I so appreciate your time and um, thanks for all you do as well and for your advocacy and and we will uh, do our best at, at Brain Injury Services to, to do the same. So thank you so much. I want to provide some resources for everybody. Uh, Dr. Jill's books, My Stroke of Insight and Whole Brain Living are available on her website, drjilltaylor.com, on Amazon and Barnes and Noble through bookshop.org and at independent bookstores. My Stroke of Insight is even available in more than a dozen languages. And her works are also available as audiobooks with Dr. Jill herself narrating. And especially for those of us in the Northern Virginia and around the DC area, my organization, Brain Injury Services, has a wealth of resources, most of them free or nearly free. And I invite you to check us out at braininjuryservices.org. Thanks again to Dr. Jill for joining us today. This conversation was fantastic. I know that I am super excited to um, continue to dig into whole brain living and learn more about my four characters. Uh, Thank you all from the audience for joining our conversation. And please check out the rest of our Brain Injury Awareness Project podcast from Brain Injury Services, which we'll be presenting throughout this next year. And you can support all of our vital work by visiting us at braininjuryservices.org slash donate. On behalf of everyone at Brain Injury Services, thank you so much for joining us. Wishing you good health and healthy brain cells.